episode 30. Let's do this. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enoch, and Business of Architecture is the show where we discuss running a great practice so you can quit worrying about paying the bills and focus instead on creating great architecture and leaving a lasting legacy. Today, we continue our conversation with architecture marketing consultant Bernie Sybin. Today, we're going to talk about how to get work with public sector and institutional clients. This is a great conversation. We discuss how to get past the gatekeepers, how to meet with the decision makers, and once you meet with them, how to turn that relationship into a project. So if you work with public sector institutional clients, get out your notepad and paper because you'll want to take notes. All right, Agile Architects, welcome back to the business of architecture. Today we're joined once again by consultant Bernie Sybin. He has 30 years of experience working with AEC firms, and what he does is he helps them write their SOQs, get excellent proposals, and help them basically market their firms better and work with public sector clients. So, Bernie, welcome back to the show. Thank you much. It's a pleasure to be back. Excellent. So just to kick it off, give me a, a business book. Last week we talked about Good to Great by Jim Collins, and you have another book that you think our audience should hear about. Yeah, yeah, and I was, I was hard. This was a hard choice. Um, I really like Seth Godin's Purple Cow. And it's a tiny book. It's really short. You can read it in an hour. But I just, there is a book called Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. And this book is subtitled The Power of Thinking Without Thinking. And what it is is he talks about all of the decisions that we make without stopping to think about them based on knowledge we've acquired over the years that we just tap into in an automatic way and and make the decision and move on um it's it's a really neat book it's a fun read um and i and i open it often just to kind of catch a couple of pages and 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 see what nugget pops up out of it but it's a, it's a book i think everybody should have on their shelf in 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 the business office if nothing else because when someone walks in the title starts conversation and we all know that you build relationships with your clients by having conversations with them. Anything that starts a conversation is good. Anything that ends a conversation is bad unless they have to leave. And anything that continues a conversation is even better. So it's a good book to have on your shelf. Or, or if you have three or four books sitting with bookends on your desk, it could be a handy prop to start conversation going. Excellent. So you gave us two books there. One was Purple Cow by Seth Godin. The other one was Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. So I would just like to take this time to say the people listening to the show, if you'd like to get either of these books for free from audible.com, get the audiobook format. I've actually listened to Blink in audible format and it was wonderful. So go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash book and go grab your free audiobook courtesy of audible.com. So, Bernie, tell me about working with public sector clients, because a lot of the shows I've done in the past focus very heavily on the residential market. And, mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's a lot of architects that listen to the show that work with public sector clients and that are out right. there doing RFPs and the more formal processes of selection. So give me a couple of pointers about working with an architect that wants to get his foot in the door or start working with public sector clients. Okay. If you are... First of all, you have to, what I call, put your butt print in the client's guest chair, okay? You do not build public sector relationships without going to visit in person, okay? Um, email is great for exchanging information. It's, it's, it ranks close to terrible for building and, and nurturing relationships. The phone is much better, but nothing beats face-to-face. Because face to face, you can't, or or having this kind of conversation as we are, so we we are face to face technically, is that you can see when someone is lying to you, and you can't on a telephone, and you can't in an email. In an email, the client often gives you whatever is the fastest answer, whether it's right or not, um, 
it's like it's like emailing a client to ask him what the problem is. The chances are he'll tell you there's no problem, and once you finish the project, he'll never call you again, and you'll never know what was wrong. Okay, or you're relying on your project manager to get to the you know to the bottom of things, and your project manager is the problem. Uh, I had a, I, I know of a firm that they got fired by a client. And the only person who didn't know it was the project manager. Uh, the next time a bill went out, the owner of that client's firm called the president of our firm and said, why are you sending me this invoice? I fired you guys two months ago. It turned out the reason he was firing us was the project manager never listened. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. So, um, it's you know, the, but the, the, the fact is that public sector is a very different animal because it's controlled by law. So, for example, if you are a, um, a develop, if you work with developers, let's say, and you are you are sending proposals out constantly to design, let's say, the the twelve um, model homes that are going to go into a new subdivision, you can, if you want to, when Christmas comes around, you can give that developer a trip to a ski trip to Switzerland with his wife, and it's perfectly legal. But when you go to develop a proposal or to submit a proposal and you, you want to build a relationship and you're making visits with the city of, of XYZ, if you bring the guy a coffee mug worth more than five bucks, it's considered bribery. Okay, I know of cities that will let their engineers go to lunch with a consultant, but only if the engineer pays for it himself. Um, Every every public agency has a different level. With some, you can give a gift up to 25 bucks. With some, you can't give a gift at all. You can't leave them that free coffee mug or whatever. And so you have to you have to find out about that. But it all comes down to the Brooks Act, which is the federal law about qualifications based selection and what you can and can't do and, and, and what owners have to set up and not set up and what have you. And uh, and so the, the marketing for the public sector is very different because there are things you can do in the private sector that will get you in jail or blacklisted if you do them on the public side. Okay. What suggestions do you have for architects to set up those face-to-face -face meetings and start to make those connections? Okay. First of all, you want to try to figure out what organizations your client belongs to. Okay. If your client, for example, is the city's facility manager, he may not be going to uh, an AIA meeting, but he may be going to some other group like Chamber of Commerce, or he may be going to if there is an association of municipal facility manager types. And so you want to go there. You want to find out what you, you want to see if, the, if there are magazines specifically for his profession. See if you can get to write for them so that the first time you go to visit him, he knows your name. Or you can bring him a copy and say, here, and I have an article in last month's issue of such and such. And, and that's a good opener as well. Um, look, at this, look at their org chart. Very often city agencies and state agencies have an organization chart in their website. And you can begin to find out who actually makes the decisions. Okay. Now, you have to understand that you may get stymied by a gatekeeper. The gatekeeper is generally an assistant or a secretary who thinks that it is his or her job to never let their boss get a visitor or a phone call because he's really busy. Okay? And so they don't understand that your phone call may be the one he needs to have. Um, sometimes I send things to people with a um, in an email and part of the email is, is, I will say, I will call you next week to talk about this. Then, of course, I'm assuming he read it, so he knows I'm going to call him next week. When I call next week, I'll say to the gatekeeper, this is Bernie Seibin calling for Joe Blow. He's expecting my call. The minute I say he's expecting my call, they cannot prevent me from talking to him because he's expecting that call. They don't know whether he said call me or whether I said I'll call you next week they just know that somehow he's been alerted to this he's expecting it so you know another thing too is if you can is to just get on good terms with the gatekeeper let them know that you understand their importance to their boss's success and you know and that kind of, but 
Make a good relationship with the gatekeeper and your call will always go through, you know. But you do want to make sure that you're talking to the right people. So look at their org charts. Use your network, okay. If you have somebody else who, who sells a different service, let's say, let's say you are a small architecture firm, but you know an engineer who sells to that city, uh, or you know an environmental firm that sells work to that state agency, call your contact, ask them, to the best of their knowledge, does this person make the decisions? And if not, ask them who does. You know, the fact is, if, if, if they sell a different service, they're not competing with you, but they could ultimately wind up on your team. Or you could wind up on theirs after you build a sufficient portfolio to be chasing things as a prime. Um, when you're a very new firm, you really have to be able to, to describe what you bring to the table that no one else does so that somebody says, you know what, I'd like to interview these people or meet with these people because nobody else that I've heard of does this, okay? But if you have opened your firm simply because you don't want someone else to be your boss anymore and you don't really have a compelling story, it may be hard to get that first interview. But if you can arrange to meet that person at a trade organization, for example, if it's a federal agency and you have a branch of SAME, the Society of American Military Engineers in your city, go to an SAME, SAME meeting and meet the person there. Then when you, you know, give them a card and say, can I call you next week? I'd like to come talk to you. There's your in, you know. Um, so it, it's, it's one of those which came first kind of things. And you may have to try both alternatives to see which one gets you in the door. But the fact is, don't give up. It may take you six calls to get a meeting and six meetings to get an RFP and six RFPs to get shortlisted and six shortlists to get selected. But if you want to work for that client, you know, and if you've done your research, you know which clients are worth pursuing at that level and which clients you should probably stay away from or at least until you've grown bigger. Gotcha. Tell me a little bit about the selection. You just you just hinted right there at the very end about how to choose the clients that may be best suited for what an architect has to offer. Do you have any suggestions for how to find that ideal client that you'd want to work with? Well, okay. First of all, you need to be able to define what for you is a strategic client. Okay, or sometimes we'll talk about them as an A client, a B client, a C client. The A client is strategic. You want to win everything you go after for them, and you want to have a big percentage of their work. The B client is, a, is still a good client, but they're not somebody that you drop everything for. The C client is somebody that you would probably be happier if they never called you again. Okay? Um, so you need to be able to figure out for yourself what makes an A client. All right? Then you can begin to figure out who might be an A client by talking to your network, by paying attention when they talk about how difficult a certain client was to work for or how wonderful that certain client is to work for. Um, and your A client is going to be things like they have a lot of different projects going on. They, uh, they understand the value of your services. They will make recommendations of you to other people, which cuts your marketing costs. They pay their bills timely, uh, and, and a number of other things um, that, that would make an A client as opposed to a B or C client. But figure out which are important to you, and if there are any others that are important to you, add those criteria to your list. And then keep your ears open and listen to people. And if you can get a meeting with a client, then ask the kind of questions that in the course of your interview, you know, you can't say to somebody, do you pay your bills on time? But there might be certain questions that allow you to gauge whether or not they do. Um, but this is something that you can gauge face to face that is going to be impossible to gauge in emails where the client's just going to say, of course we pay our bills on time, you know, um, or on the telephone where the client is going to say, of course we pay our bills on time, but you won't see him wince before he says that. Um, okay. So, so the fact is that you do want to find a way to meet people in person, whether it's at a trade show or at a, a, an organization that they belong to. And you don't have to belong to every organization. You can, you know, for whatever the event is, whether it's a breakfast or a lunch, if you're not a member, the worst that'll happen is it costs you $10 more than the member pays, but you can still go to the event. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So you have given us at least five excellent uh, suggestions for how to meet these people. And so thank you for that. 
Very interesting. Now, once you've met the, this person, this decision maker, Bernie, mm -hmm. what suggestions do you have for fostering that relationship and turning that eventually into work? Okay. There is a book out there called How to Get the Income... Is it, no, how to get the competition fired without saying anything bad about them. Okay. We all think that if we give a proposal to someone, there are two parties to that transaction, us and the people we give the proposal to. This book tells you there are actually three parties, you, the owner you gave your proposal to, and his incumbent consultant, because he's going to show your proposal to the consultant, to the incumbent, and say, can you do this much for that price? Or can you meet this price for what you're doing right now? Okay. Now, you can't say to a client or potential client, you hired the wrong consultant, because that's like calling him stupid. Okay. And what if he's the one who chose the consultant? Then the chances are that they, even if they make a change, they're not going to select you because you're the one who called them stupid. Okay. So the way, the way that you do this because unless it's a new entity, they already have incumbents, okay, is that you have to find ways to show the client he is currently being underserved, okay? And so if you can show him how much more you can do for him without mentioning price, then you're going to get a hearing. He will invite you to, you know, he'll say, by all means, come talk to me, bring me your stuff, or send me your stuff, let me look at it before you get here. And then he'll have questions that he wants to ask you. And so you will you will get in the door that way, but you have to be able to show him how whoever his incumbent is, and mostly with a public agency, you can find out who that incumbent is because their website is going to have to have a procurement section that will show not only the jobs that are coming up, but who won the jobs that have already been allocated. And so you will know who's in, who his incumbents are for various types of work. And if this is a, pro a project that comes out every year for, tw for a 12-month period, you will know who the current person is just by looking back to see who won the job a year ago. Not a problem. Uh, and, and so there you have your incumbent, and, and you should be able to figure out from their website and from, uh, from your network by talking to people what, they, what these guys do really good and what things – what things they do not so good that maybe you do better or can do better, and what things they don't do at all that you do before yeah. you start trying to, to, to show this client what you would bring to the table that his incumbent doesn't. Okay. okay? So, you, so you have all of that. The, the other thing to be really careful of is that if you get invited to submit a proposal is – Somewhere in the RFP, there will be an organization for the proposal, even if it's just what order does he discuss things in. In some RFPs, they'll talk about wanting to know your experience before they talk about wanting to know your staff. In some, it'll be the other way around. Whatever order the client asks for, you must, absolutely must, with capital letters, use that format. Okay? The first look at a proposal involves no, almost no reading. Okay? It, in, it, is in, it is designed to throw as many proposals in the trash can as being non-responsive so that instead of reading 40, they might only have to read nine. Okay? So if they give you an organization in the RFP, you have to use that because the first person who looks is someone I call the fool with the checklist. And all he's looking for is the subject and sub -sub headers and subheaders to make sure you have addressed everything in your proposal that is in the RFP. If you reorganize to put it in what you think is a more logical order, the first time he gets to something that's not where his checklist says it should be, you'll be thrown out for being non-responsive. He won't care that you actually have that section, but it's four, line, four items later. He won't even look. Okay. All he knows is, ooh, ooh, item number six on the checklist is not here after item number five, and you're gone. Okay, so never reorganize if they give you an organization and make sure you answer everything and set up checklists if you need to. I had a million dollar proposal get thrown out as non-responsive because I forgot to get one form signed. It happens. Hopefully it only happens to you once because uh, you learn the value of having a checklist. <laughs> that you make up, that you start making when you when you first read the RFP and start listing all the things that you're going to need. But the fact is, you have to have everything they say they want 
in the order they want it, or you, or somehow you will be thrown out for being non-responsive on that first go round. Yeah, I think that would be a lesson. Hopefully, someone would only only have to learn once. Now, what do you have any ways to do? You have any ways that you could suggest that architects could go about finding if a client is being underserved? You mentioned talking to other people that do business with them. What sort of little tricks can you give us for snooping around and finding what's not being done correctly? Well, Okay. It's not a question of what's not being done correctly. It's a question of what's simply not being done. Okay. Okay. Now, every document you submit as a proposal or an SOQ to a public agency, once the selection is made, it's a public document. You can get a copy of it. Okay. You may have to go to the Freedom of Information Act if somebody really wants to make it hard for you to get a copy, but you legally have a right to a copy of that document. Okay, so by reading the proposal and the scope of work and then thinking to yourself, with this scope of work, what else would I have suggested as a part of this project? Okay, very often the client's scope of work, when, when the client wants to, when the client needs to, to put out an RFP, they don't write a new RFP. They, they stick their head in the hall and they shout, anybody got an RFP I can borrow? Somebody gives them an RFP. They go to the scope, they add all the stuff they need for their project, but they don't read what's already there. So it's going to ask for a lot of stuff that's unnecessary. H however, there could be stuff as you read it, you're thinking to yourself, well, you know what, if they're going to do this, this, and this, it makes sense they should also want to do this. But it's nowhere near the, nowhere is in the RFP. Well, then you take a look at the proposal. If whoever won didn't propose that as part of their approach, the chances are that it's not happening. Now, it may have been negotiated as part of the fee schedule, but the chances are it's not happening because the client never said, for example, very often the RFP will say, if there's anything else you think we need to be doing, tell us about it. But if they didn't and the, and the, and the guy in his proposal never mentioned it, chances are it's not happening. You might be able to say the next time that same project comes up, like if it's an annual kind of list, you might want to put in your proposal, we think if you're going to do A, B, C, and D, then you ought to do E and F as well, and we can do that for you. Okay, there's something you bring to the table. It may be uh, that there was a time when, you know, now everybody has GPS surveying, but when GPS first appeared, and only, you know, maybe one firm out of 50 had it, the fact that you could say, well, we're going to do GPS surveying, which gets us from the field to the printed sheet of paper without any place for human error. Okay, so that was a big deal. Okay, five years later, every survey firm had GPS, and so it was no longer a selling point. So, you know, the question is, what's new and do you have it? If you have it and a lot of other people don't, that's something you can bring to the table as well that might not have been brought by the incumbent two years ago, let's say. And look for, look for those kinds of things. But you can actually get a copy of the document. And remember that every time you don't get selected, and, and most of the time when you do get selected, you should request a debriefing. And then you can say to them, well, what is it about the, what is it about the, the guy you selected? What about his proposal that you didn't see in mine? And they'll tell you what he had that you didn't. They might even, and you might even say to them, you know, would you mind if I took a look at it? And they'll pull it out and give it to you because under the Freedom of Information Act, it's a public document. They can't prevent you from seeing it. They can make it difficult, but they can't totally prevent you. And so you, you may be able to just look at the guy's proposal and see what you to put in that he left out. Awesome. 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 Bernie, if there's people out here who want to get in contact with you because they're going after one of these clients, one of these projects, you know, give us the information. Where does someone go to find out more about you and what you do? Well, my firm is the Cybin Consult LLC, and you can find me online at www.cybenconsult.com, and that's S for Sam, I, B for boy, E, N for normal, which almost never happens in our profession. Um, but cybenconsult.com, uh, you will find articles that I have written there. You will find a way to contact me there, both by phone and by email, uh, if you want to request my SOQ. Um, uh, you, you can certainly have a copy of it from me. and. Um, I think that Enoch may be able to supply the SOQ to some people. I think I've sent it to him, but if not, you can get it through me through my website. Um, you will find articles that I've written in, in various wide, wide, 
publications. I write for the Zweig Letter, and I've had three articles so far this year in CE News uh, on marketing issues related to AE firms. And so it's there, and if anybody wants to hurry up and call, the phone number is 559-901-9596. It's a Central California area code, but I'm actually in Austin, Texas, so two hours later than the California folks. Excellent. Thank you, Bernie. Thank Go you. On. Yeah. Go ahead and finish this off with a success quote. Do you have a success quote for this episode, by chance? I don't have a success quote. But what I what I have is is a philosophy that I I think that when you market you have to have a very special mindset and too many people when they hit a wall they give up and the real marketing mindset hits that wall and immediately starts thinking can I go around it can I go over it can I go under it can I build a doorway and that's a wrap for how do I get show through the about wall the business of and I think that you have to be to flexible enough to look at how you to you understand that there's more than one way to get there land the projects and you if love one way is closed to you don't give up find another way day back. Join awesome. the members only awesome. business of architecture right insider well, list Bernie, for free us a lot of by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free. Enter my your pleasure, best email address Eddie, there, and I will okay. send you bye -bye. instant access to free resources, including my book, Social Media for Architects. If you'd like to discuss a thought or insight from today's show, visit businessofarchitecture.com slash podcast. On that page, you'll also find my notes from today's show and the action items I took away from our conversation. Until next week. Keep rocking and go conquer the world. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help architects conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.